It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I want to um, start by acknowledging the remarks of Saul Mamakwa, the uh, member for Quitnung and the Government House Leader for allowing us to take this moment in time. Uh, but now it's my job to change the topic, Speaker, and so I'm going to ask my first question to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, on Friday, uh, the Premier said this in relation to the vaccine rollout uh, here in the province, and I quote, I've never seen a more well-oiled machine. Meanwhile, doctors and experts everywhere have been calling it chaotic, confusing, uh, the Hunger Games. Clearly, if the Premier Premier thinks that this is a weld oil machine, he certainly hasn't learned from his mistakes. The question is, why hasn't he fixed his mistakes from the initial rollout to the rollout of dose two? To reply on behalf of the government, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the answer would be because there's nothing wrong with the plan. The plan is being rolled out across the province. We have reached over 65 percent of all Ontarians over 18 receiving at least one dose. We currently stand at 67 percent. Nine million vaccines have already been given to people across the province, and we have virtually six million further um, booked and ready to go, and we have the supply coming in. So the plan is rolling out in the way that it was supposed to, and will continue to do so. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, the big problem is the way it was supposed to wasn't good enough and didn't do justice to the people of Ontario. Every one for themselves is not a plan to roll out a vaccine that ensures that the most vulnerable receive the vaccines first. In fact, this government left the most vulnerable behind. Dr. Nathan Stahl says this, and I quote, This is going to create, I fear, the sort of vaccine Hunger Games 2.0 for these older adults, where they're now being asked to go back into the multiple booking systems through multiple sites. And meanwhile, we all know the mass confusion that continues to swirl around the AstraZeneca vaccine. So my question again to this Premier is, why did he and his government not learn from his mistakes from the rollout of dose one and are continuing to roll out dose two in the same chaotic, confused, and confusing way. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I would suggest to the Leader of the Opposition that, given the fact that we've already had over 9 million vaccines already given to people, with almost 6 million already booked, that there are, most Ontarians do not seem confused by this rollout. And In fact, this is actually good news that we've announced, that if people wish to receive their doses sooner than the date that they have the appointment for, they can do that. They can do that online. They can do that actually through the pharmacies where they originally had them, or through their primary care provider. But if they choose to stay with the dose that they a date that they already have booked for their second dose, they're free to do that. But if they wish to move it forward, they can do that as well. That's choice to the people of Ontario. That's what people have been telling us that we want. And we have a system in place that's ready and available to allow them to do that. The final supplementary. Speaker, it's not about how many doses have been given out. It's about how they've been given out. The rollout has left those who are most vulnerable, who need protection the most, getting the least access to the vaccines. We saw as this government was dragged kicking and screaming into addressing the hotspot issue and then abandoned that strategy a week early. Vulnerable two weeks early, I think. Anyways, vulnerable students, or rather vulnerable uh, seniors, are still likely to less likely to have their for, first dose. So it's not about all those can, who can easily access, it's about those who cannot easily access. And we know that seniors still are in that position, never mind trying to chase down their second dose. Meanwhile, report after report of people trying to bully their ways to the second dose has been uh, continuing to question. show up in the media. So the question is, where is the plan to ensure that those who need the vaccines the most, the most vulnerable, are easily able to access them? Mr. Thank you, 
Speaker. In fact, I would say to the Leader of the Opposition through you, Speaker, that what she is suggesting is simply not the case. We have a strategy which we have implemented, which we implemented during the month of May for two weeks, where we allocated 50 per cent of our vaccines to the hotspot areas, and it worked. Right now, we have a situation where the people in the hotspot areas are at almost 8 per cent more likely to have been vaccinated by the first dose than people in non-hotspot areas. So we followed the recommendations that were made by the medical experts. They originally recommended uh, four weeks, but that was before we knew we were getting double the number of cases, a double the number of doses. So we have actually followed what they suggested. We are paying attention to the hotspot areas, as well as to our seniors. We prioritize people in long-term care homes and retirement homes, and now, starting as of today, people who are 80 and older, if they wish to accelerate their second dose, they can do so. If they don't wish to, they can stay with the time that they already have booked. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Speaker, students and their uh, and their parents have been left in limbo now, waiting for the details of the possible uh, reopening of schools. For over a year, unfortunately, this Premier decided to dismiss the concerns of parents, of teachers and education workers, uh, as they insisted uh, that schools were safe. And now, of course, uh, we know that they decided to cut the education budget, which just today was confirmed by the Financial Accountability Officer of Ontario. Thursday, the Premier finally decided to lob a frantic last-minute consultation uh, into the uh, into the communities. Uh, my guess, my question is, why didn't the Premier think uh, it, for over a year that the kids of this province school, uh, the kids of this province education and their schooling? wasn't more important for him to take action instead of waiting until the very last minute. To reply, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the Chief Medical Officer of Health has confirmed in local, Medical Officers of Health have done the same. They have noted the schools have been safe. We've always acknowledged that schools reflect our community. Order. Now, back last summer, we put in place a $1.6 billion plan that allowed us to hire 7,000 staff, 1,400 additional custodians, improve air ventilation in 95% of schools, procure 40,000 HEPA units to support them, uh, more than quadrupled mental health funding for students from when the former Liberal government was in power, and, Mr. Speaker, the only province in the nation to have a targeted asymptomatic testing program. That has all led us to one of the lowest case rates for youth under 20 in Canada because we followed that advice. And yes, Mr. Speaker, we are obviously broadening the consultation to ensure we get this decision right, to not compromise the incredible hard work and sacrifice Ontarians have made together to get our case rates down over the past weeks and get our vaccination up in the province of Ontario. The supplementary. Well, Speaker, I just have to say it speaks volumes that for a year almost, the government didn't even bother to launch a consultation, and they waited to the very last minute to, uh, to engage at this point, which is just completely unacceptable, considering that it's been, as I said, close to a year. Too close to a year that this premier and this government have been dismissing concerned about school safety. In fact, uh, one of the um, the teachers uh, who spoke out against this uh, particular uh, last-minute uh, consultation uh, says this: um, Aaron Roy, Essex area educator, says giving somebody a day's notice when we've been begging all year to be consulted on these decisions, I don't think, is genuine. Speaker, schools were supposed to be the first to open and the last to close. Question. This government attacked teachers who raised COVID questions all the way along, and now the science table has weighed in, public health has weighed in, educators has weighed in, and they have weighed in, and they've all said it's time to safely look to a regional approach to open schools. When is the government going to do that? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Well, let's, uh, let's take the perspective of Dr. Judy, the head of the science table, who reported last week, and I quote, Ontario, unlike other places in the world, did a relatively good job if you compare it to the United Kingdom. Our way of cohorting, our way of masking of kids is much, much better. Dr. Williams said just days ago, our schools were safe before we closed down in the rapid rise of the third wave. Speaker, we have consulted, we have invested, we put in place a plan that leads the nation, and our commitment is to take the time to get this right to continue to consult and obviously uh, to provide the certainty all parents and students in Ontario deserve. 
Then the final supplementary. Speaker, it has been a really tough year for parents and for kids, particularly because they've been stuck at home for months. Kids are missing their friends. They're missing the social uh, interactions that we all know that they need. Parents have been missing a normal life, but also have been very, very worried about their children's ability to learn. They've been watching their kids become more and more depressed and more and more lonely. Nothing that they can do uh, about that has, has, has occurred, though. I mean, they are sitting unable to address what's happening to their children. The Premier should have made schools a top priority speaker, and he didn't. Instead, he denied that there were problems in schools, he attacked teachers and education workers, and he had the gall, at a time like this, to make cuts to our classrooms. I think it's time for this Premier to actually follow the science table advice, Question. listen to the advice that they're receiving, provide the money to every uh, region necessary to open their schools uh, safely. Speaker, Will he do that? Minister of Education. We'll continue to provide school boards with unprecedented access to investment. $1.6 billion this current school year, $2 billion in the coming school year, over half a billion dollar increase in the grant for student needs, $85 million targeting uh, learning supports and summer learning. As well, uh, Mr. Speaker, is a $1.6 billion renewal of COVID-19 resources. The difference between this year and next year is there's no federal dollars. The prov province is leading the way entirely by ensuring every public health measure is in place, even though we know with vaccinations of all students double, double dosed by September and with all Canadians potentially double dosed by September, it gives us a great sense of hope about the fall. Notwithstanding, we have those investments in place so that there is a commitment to parents and to students and to the staff within our schools that we're going to keep them safe as we look forward. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Indigenous people across Canada are hurting. This weekend, the bodies of 215 lost children were discovered at a mass grave site near the former Kamloops Residential School. The death of Indigenous children is a crime against humanity, and the country must own up to its past, as must all governments and all institutions. It is a great open secret that children lie on the properties of former residential schools, an open secret that Canadians can no longer look back from. In keeping with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's missing children projects, every school must be searched for the graves of our ancestors. Will this government commit today to searching the grounds of the former residential schools in Ontario for lost Indigenous children? Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the honourable member, and I understand uh, how uh, challenging uh, uh, this uh, past weekend uh, certainly has been. I think the request is uh, uh, is certainly a, a reasonable one, and we look forward to working uh, uh, with uh, uh, with First Nations to ensure that that gets done. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. All Indigenous people living today in Canada are survivors of Canada's genocide, survivors of Indian residential schools survivors of the Indian Act, survivors of the 60s scoop, survivors of ongoing child apprehension, and survivors of ongoing systemic racism, which attempts to erase identities, cultures, and languages. This government must work towards an honest reckoning with our past. It's time for the Ontario government to accept responsibility and take action to ensure justice, dignity, and equity for all Indigenous people. Will this government commit today to secure justice for all the families impacted by the horrors of Indian residential schools and create an annual day of mourning and remembrance for those we lost to residential schools and the survivors and their families. Thank you. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I really, I, I do appreciate the, uh, the question from uh, from the honourable gentleman or honourable member. Excuse me. Uh, uh, did uh, obviously the, the member for Kewatin's uh, message was uh, very very clearly heard by all of us. Uh, 
uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I uh, certainly do look forward to working uh, closely with the members uh, opposite uh, uh, to ensure that perhaps even before we adjourn this place that we can bring forward a bill that would recognize something like that. Uh, uh, so I do look forward to working with the member. The member, of course, will know how important uh, private members' business is in this place, and I think uh, that certainly is something that we should be working on together. Thank you. Next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The residents of Barry Innisfil, like so many Ontarians, are eager to get their summer back with the state home order expiring this week. But in order to move forward, we know that stricter border measures uh, stop the spread of COVID-19. This is a fact backed by science and data, as well as experiences of countries from around the world that have implemented with success stricter border restrictions to stop the entry of COVID-19. We also know that this isn't just international travellers. COVID-19 enters Ontario via other provinces as well. While our government continues to urgently request real action to secure our borders, this is simply not a priority for the Prime Minister. Can the Solicitor General update the residents of Barry Innisfil and all Ontarians on the status of our government's way to maintain our borders and secure Ontarians? To reply, the Solicitor General. And thank you to the member from Barry Innisfil. I know that she understands only too clearly how variants can devastate a community. The third wave in Ontario was fueled by variants discovered in other countries, with vast majority of cases being variants of concerns. That's why the emergency order restricting travel into Ontario from Manitoba and Quebec's land and water borders has been extended until June the 16th. We also continue to advocate for the federal government to restrict Order. travel through federally regulated air travel. Our government has written four separate letters with very specific, urgent requests to the federal government, asking them to take action, only to get a vague and non-responsive answer in return. Now, as we are gaining ground on the new variants, we see our case counts drop. It's time Response. for the federal government to take this seriously and address the border issues through stricter controls for domestic flights and international travel. Thank you, Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, over the, uh, the past few weeks, we have seen a crest on Ontario's third wave with cases dropping and hospitalization starting to decompress, which is great news for all Ontarians. But with case counts improving, I know that many Ontarians are also planning their Ontario staycations, but are also wondering what other provinces and why the interprovincial restrictions are still remaining in place. So can the minister provide details as to why it's so important for these restrictions and why they're still needed? Mr. General. I will, and thank you for your interest in this issue. The Northwestern Public Health Unit is doing a great job, consistently having some of the lowest case counts over the past seven days. On Sunday, they reported zero new cases. We need to remember that our neighbour province, Manitoba, are in the middle of a very serious outbreak. Ontario will continue to offer any help we can, including by assisting having 24 Manitoba residents currently in Ontario ICU. We look forward to welcoming Manitobans back soon, but we can see the positive effect of reducing mobility from areas that are experiencing out outbreaks to isolated communities like the Northwest has had. Premier Ford has repeatedly asked the federal government to step up and do its job just like we are doing ours. We continue Response. to make very clear to the federal government. We're imploring them to take stricter measures at the border. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. Last week, the Review Board for Colleges and Universities, PCAB, rejected Charles McVitie's university application, and Ontarians gave a sigh of relief. This government snuck favorable legislation into an omnibus bill to allow Charles McVitie an even bigger platform for spewing his hateful bigotry against the 2SLGBTQ community and Muslim Ontarians. Speaker, this bill should have never been passed in the first place, and members on this side of the House were proud to vote against it. On the eve of pride, it's absolutely necessary this government take a stand against all homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia in our province. Will the government do the right thing and rip up Section 2 of Bill 213 today? To reply, the Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. 
Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we join the member opposite in condemning any form of hate in this province, regardless of where it may stem from. Speaker, with respect to um, the legislation before the House and with respect to the independent PCAB process, as we said from day one, we lean on the independent expert advice of the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assurance Board. And Mr. Speaker, we said we would respect their decision, and we've done just that. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, if this government condemned hatred, then they wouldn't have passed 213 and snuck in Schedule 2 in the first place. My question is back to the Premier. Charles McVitie has already launched a campaign to convince the government to give royal assent to the, his bill. He's now attacking the public servants who reviewed his application and has put out a video calling for the government to ignore the process, something they might be willing to do for their longtime political buddy. Every day this legislation sits on the books is one day closer to giving Charles McVitie what he wants. The only way forward is to rip up the section of the bill and add transparency to the PCAB process. Along with my colleagues, I have legislation to rip up Section 2 of Bill 213. Will the government do the right thing and pass this legislation immediately? Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the strength of our post-secondary system is because of the independent analysis of groups like the PCAB process, Mr. Speaker. It's because of those independent processes, independent of, polit of politicians, that we have a high-quality education system, a high-quality education system void of the hate that the member uh, speaks opposite. And Mr. Speaker will always respect that independent process. It's because of those independent processes that we've seen expansion at Algoma University of degree granting authority. It's because of that independence that we've seen OCAT expand their process. And Mr. Speaker, we've said from day one we'd respect that independent process, and that's exactly what we've done. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to acknowledge and uh, thank the member for Kuetnung for his remarks. Um, yeah. S speaker. Um, my, grand, my first three grandchildren's paternal Moshim and Kokum were survivors of uh, residential school. And um, a few years ago, on a field trip to a sugar bush, when my eldest grandchild was in grade one, um, a child in the class asked where all the First Nations people had gone. And my daughter happened to be volunteering, and she said, well, they're right here. And as the member for Kuetnung said, they are right here. We are all here. Um, we cannot expect children to know our shared shame or our history, our true history, unless we teach it. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Will the government reverse its decision of 2019 and make Indigenous ec education and the true teaching of residential schools mandatory at both the elementary and the secondary levels? To apply, the government has to Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I certainly appreciate the question from uh, uh, from the member opposite. Look, uh, we all have. Uh, uh, it has become clearer and clearer every day. If it hasn't been to, to people, how important it is that uh, uh, that we do all that we can to ensure that there is reconciliation uh, uh, across uh, across Canada. Uh, I think the the member opposite's words today were. Uh, uh, just another in a series of very powerful indications of how important that is. So I certainly want to work uh, and continue to work uh, uh, with all members in, in the House in a, in a nonpartisan way to make sure that we can we can move the ball even further. Uh, and and uh, uh, you know, one of the hardest things uh, of being a member here, having been elected here, is to hear the member for Kiwatin talk about how he doesn't feel part of this place, how it doesn't always reflect. Uh, uh, um, the the Ontario or the Canada uh, that he knows. So we have a, a, a job to do to make sure that we get that done, Mr. Speaker. Today, our focus is going to be on the horrific circumstances that we saw in, in British Columbia and making sure that we can do our best uh, to do Response. right by those families and those families in the province uh, of Ontario who have suffered uh, for far too long. Supplementary question. Um, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> With all due respect, the focus for today, yes, is on the, those little children whose, um, whose remains were found, and it is a horrific story that, as the member for Kuetnung has said, has been repeated all over this country. And so 
if the government is serious, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the gestures of flags being raised at half mast and so on. I stood in this House as the Premier and made an apology, and that was a gesture. But, Mr. Speaker, those gestures have to be backed up with action. And one of the first things that this government did when it came into office was to stop the writing of curriculum that would have embedded the truth about Indigenous people in this country in our curriculum. Will the Premier please make it clear and ensure that that has been rectified, that in fact the path that we were on in 2018, which was to back up the gestures with real action, that that action is being taken, and that if it's not, that it will start tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Governor Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, frankly, Mr. Speaker, I think the path that we take can be a better one. Uh, I absolutely, positively believe that it can be a better one. It can be a better one for First Nations when it comes to health, when it comes to education. It can be a better one for the people of the province of Ontario so that they can better understand the horrors that the member for Kewatin has talked about. Do we have more work to do? Absolutely we do, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely, we do. We have a responsibility to help, as the, as the member for, I believe, Toronto, uh, uh, Senator Rosedale talked about, ensuring that we go to other residential schools to find, uh, to find the truth at these schools. So do we have a better job to do, as the member for Don Valley uh, West talks about? Absolutely. Will this government wait 15 years to go down that path? No. We are going to do everything we can to live up to the responsibilities that every Ontario government has, Bonds. giving our First Nations the best opportunity to live, work and prosper in the province of Ontario. It's our responsibility, and we'll get it done finally. The next question, once again, the member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the hardworking Minister of Heritage, Tourism and Sport and Culture. The Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens rivalry has a long history in the NHL, and tonight marks Game 7 of the Stanley Cup's final opening round between the two storied franchises. On Saturday, 2,500 fans attended Game 6 at Bell Centre in Montreal. The atmosphere was ecstatic, and the energy was felt by the players and the fans across the country. MLSC has proposed a plan to allow fully vaccinated healthcare workers to attend tonight's Game 7. That, is, that will be the first time the Leafs and Habs has met for the playoffs since 1979. Will the government allow some of our healthcare workers to attend tonight's game and cheer on our beloved Toronto Maple Leafs? Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker. May I first uh, say and acknowledge the member for her great work in this assembly. And just last week, uh, she helped moderate a Jewish Heritage Month event with me to showcase Ontario's great diversity. And may I say before I get started to the member from Kwatin and Toronto Centre and uh, Toronto, uh, uh, Don Valley West, uh, how, uh, how thoughtful your comments have been today. And I do apologize for the noise that's out there because today should have been a solemn one where we were able to listen and, and hear um, and, and to speak uh, your truth. Um, but I will say today we do have a bit of great news. We were able to work with the Chief Medical Officer of Health over the evening, as well as Toronto Public Health, in order to ensure that 550 frontline health care workers who have been fully vaccinated will be able to take in the seventh and final game of round one of the Canadian League uh, from the NHL. I want to thank uh, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment for covering all of the costs to say thank you to these frontline heroes, and also to Scotiabank for allowing each uh, member that will be admitted uh, to be wearing a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey. Now, you know, Speaker, uh, my my, my team is the Ottawa Senators, but I will conclude on this. Go Leafs, go. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Minister. This is great news, not only for Leaf fans, but of course our frontline heroes who are going to be uh, at the game tonight and uh, many who are watching in the province. It is evident that the plan is working, and now we know that 550 fans uh, will be uh, able to boost the boys in blue and their spirits as they get past the Montreal Canadiens and hopefully for the win tonight. As we know, and many residents in, in Barrie and Isville are also wondering, you know, sports plays a really big part in our province, and uh, they're really looking forward to the return to play. So I'm wondering if the minister can uh, tell us how she's supporting the return to play on all fronts. Mr. Heritage. 
very much, uh, Speaker. Um, obviously, I want to thank the Ontario Hospital Association for running the lottery today to allow those 550 frontline health care workers who have been fully vaccinated uh, to get back to play. Last Friday, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Marnie McBean, the chef de mission uh, for Team Canada, as we uh, started to inoculate through donated Pfizer uh, vaccines all of Team Canada's Ontario athletes. That's 1,100, and we're happy to do that at the Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario. But last year, we uh, committed over $59.4 million. That is an increase of $15.3 million to get sport back in the province of Ontario. And as we get more people with vaccines and we start to see cases go down and warmer weather, it's my hope that we can continue to work with the, with the central health table in order to get our sports not back only up and running for, for training and practice purposes, but that we can actually start to look at what a return to play for amateur and professional Response. athletes look like and what a return to fans and stands will look like in a longer term. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul. Speaker, tomorrow is June 1st. Rent is due yet again for small business owners in St. Paul's. Store owners who can have pivoted online and, of course, curbside delivery, but overall sales have plummeted for most of our small businesses. The Eglinton Crosstown LRT has literally ripped through our midtown community in St. Paul's for over a decade. Recently, Crosslinks won their court case against the government's Metrolinks and Infrastructure Ontario. Crosslinks got the pandemic declared an emergency, which means they're now negotiating with the government for more cash to complete the project and a later completion date. All this means years more of chaos, barely any customer parking, blocked access to storefronts, inaccessible sidewalks, and in general, economic trauma to our businesses in St. Paul's and across that Eglinton LRT strip. My question is to the Premier, Speaker. Will this government finally support our NDP official opposition motion demanding a complete ban on evictions for our commercial small businesses throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes or no? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Look, uh, the, the, we have been working flat out to ensure that our uh, small, medium and large job creators have all the tools that they need to uh, uh, to not only survive what has been a devastating uh, global health and economic uh, pandemic, but as we emerge from uh, from uh, the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, so that they can thrive like never before in the province of Ontario. It is why we are so committed to a framework that is, yes, cautious, Mr. Speaker, but will get us through uh, 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 through these final stages of, uh, of uh, what I hope will be the, the end of COVID-19 uh, COVID in the province of Ontario, so that, again, we can see a, a rebound in our economic activity. The type of rebound that we saw prior uh, prior to COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, prior to COVID-19, Ontario was leading in job creation. We were leading in economic, uh, in economic development. We were making important investments to help grow our economy, transit, transportation. Mr. Speaker, that's what we want to see as we emerge from COVID-19, and we're giving them all the tools that they need so that they can prosper as we come out of this. Supplementary question. Speaker, when a small business closes, families suffer, jobs are lost, and the very culture, heritage, and identity of our communities is also disappeared. This government must consult with our small businesses, loosen the eligibility requirements of the Broken Ontario Small Business Support Grant Program, keep workers on payroll, and help businesses get to reopening day, especially those that are owned by black and racialized and women entrepreneurs who we know historically have faced systemic discrimination. In Little Jamaica, in Little Jamaica alone, Black Urbanism Toronto reported over 140 businesses closed since the beginning of the construction, and that list has ballooned with the pandemic. My question again is to the Premier. Will the Premier support my motion calling for a Little Jamaica economic health and community wellness strategy, which includes direct funding to small businesses, heritage designation of Little Jamaica, an art strategy showcasing the cultural wealth of our community, and the building question. of real affordable housing in all new residential construction? Thank you, Speaker. The, uh, parliamentary Assistant. Oh, sorry, the, sorry, the Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, appreciate uh, the member opposite uh, bringing forward these concerns. We have uh, hosted numerous consultations uh, with uh, uh, business owners, uh, uh, chambers across this province, racialized communities, to see the impact uh, that COVID is having 
on specific businesses. We will continue to ensure um, that those businesses uh, have access to, uh, to the government, uh, continue listening to their concerns. Um, we have, uh, to date, through the Ontario Small Business Support Grant, uh, paid out uh, over 110,000 uh, small businesses, totaling over $1.5 a billion dollars uh, in support that uh, we've also put forward over 86,000 automatic second payments totaling an additional 1.2 billion dollars to support these Better. small businesses that continue uh, to struggle as we get through this pandemic but as, uh, uh, as we look uh, forward mr. speaker uh, the reopening plan has been set forward we're going to continue to invest in the digitization of the member for Toronto st. Paul's come to order continue to do whatever we can to ensure that Spons. small businesses can get back on their feet. The next question, the member for York Centre. The Speaker to the Government House Leader. Today the House Leader will whip the vote and force PC MPPs to vote in favour of a motion giving this government power to extend the emergency orders until December. Extension will be done by a government-run committee without debate or vote in this House. Today the government will cut Parliament out of its most impactful decisions in our lifetimes. The Premier will have the ability to close schools, lock down business, and prevent us from seeing family, all because he says so. Speaker, this is an unprecedented abuse of power. This is an, the most undemocratic thing Order. to be done in this parliament since it was convened more than 150 years ago. It's unnecessary, and it's hostile to Canada's democracy. Our democracy should not be eroded at a time of an emergency. That's what dictatorships do. So my question to the government House Leader, will the House Leader back away from this assault on democracy and permit PC MPP a free vote on today's motion to extend the emergency orders. To reply, the government house leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, it's interesting coming from this gentleman who has all of a sudden become very independent-minded because he voted in favour of every single uh, measure that this government took in order to keep the people of the province of Ontario safe. In fact, when the original uh, uh, reopening Ontario uh, uh, bill was passed, he was very happy to go into the lobby and vote in favour of that. Unlike the member for Cambridge, who stood on a point of order on her own and voted against the bill, this gentleman here was enthusiastic in voting in support of that bill. So, Mr. Speaker, we are very happy that uh, we have made such tremendous progress in, in defeating uh, uh, COVID-19. The battle is not quite done yet, Mr. Speaker, and I know that a lot of people would like to declare victory. It's not over yet. If we're going to see our small, medium and large job creators prosper, if we're going to see the province move out of this and put COVID response. behind us, we need to work again to continue to work very hard, Mr. Speaker. So in response to the member opposite, no, we will not declare victory over COVID-19 until we actually have. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I've indicted the government that this is the most undemocratic thing to be done in this House for the last 150 years, and all that the House leader can do is suggest that I voted in favour of this a year ago. This is about a month after he threatened to, to kick me out. A month after he threatened to kick me out for opposing the lockdowns, and all of these members are sitting there, Minister and they know what went on, and yet still they clap for him. Yes, I voted for this a year ago, and imagine a year ago later we're still at it again, even though the entire world moved on. BC almost out. Alberta says it will remove all restrictions, even masks, in a month. Meanwhile, they want the ability to extend it by six months. Yes, my friend from Cambridge stood out and she was kicked out. She's seated a few feet away from me. I remain for six months to try and steer this government away from the insanity, from the catastrophe that they've imposed on the government, on, on this Order. province. The member from Cambridge Mr. and Heritage I are doing, We're doing our jobs. We're sent here to represent our constituents, not to be mouthpieces, repeating talking points or voting Question. how we're told. You see, this is what this motion is doing, Mr. Speaker. It's eliminating the function of this chamber. So my question, will the House Leader permit a free vote on this motion, yes or no? Government House Leader. Uh, sir, I, yeah, I, I must have missed that extra six months that he granted to us to help us, uh, to help us in COVID, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, but this is a gentleman who, in March, voted. Park Center, come to order. Government House Leader, please reply. This, this is a, a member who, in March, voted uh, in favour of measures. Uh, uh, in April, voted in favour of these measures. In May, voted in favour of these measures. In June, voted in favour of these measures. In July, voted in favour of these measures. In September, voted in favour of these measures. Now, of course, from September, October, November and December, we're just finding out that he was doing that for us that he was doing that for us. So I appreciate how much he was doing that 
for us and the assistance that he gave us in steering the province through COVID-19, Mr. Speaker. But I'm also appreciative of the fact that he's now over there, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Associate Minister of Small Businesses and Red Tape Production. As this government continues to support small businesses with direct support. Or stop the clock. The member for York Centre will come to order. The government house leader will come to order. Next, if it continues, we'll move to warnings very quickly. Please start the clock. I apologize to the member for Barry Innisville. Speaker, uh, my question to the Associate Minister of Small Businesses and Red Tape Production. Uh, since day one, our government has done much to unshackle uh, the burdens that small businesses incurred after years of mismanagement by reducing red tape. We provided them hope. And during this pandemic, this government continued to support small businesses with direct supports. But we know that structural changes are going to be just as important to help businesses to recover from long-standing issues and to help them succeed through the recovery. Can the minister tell this House how he's addressing many regulatory burdens and particular that's, impor that's particularly important to the economic recovery? The Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Barry Innisville for that question and I appreciate all the leadership that she has shown uh, to ensure that businesses have the right conditions uh, to continue uh, making sure that Ontario remains the most competitive jurisdiction in North America in attracting new investments. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, with the legislation that we have put forward in this House, we are modernizing Ontario by bringing more processes online, services online, including developing new applications that will allow online sticker renewal for heavy commercial vehicles uh, vehicle license plates. Uh, we are cr creating innovative uh, new revenue streams to help Main Street businesses uh, seize every opportunity to succeed. Um, and among other things, we're bringing certainty uh, uh, in our critical mining industry by capping timelines on closure plans. Mr. Speaker, we have a wide variety of approaches that we are taking to ensure that Ontario remains Fonts? competitive, uh, that it continues to be a great jurisdiction uh, for investment. Very innocent. Well, thank you to the minister for restoring competitiveness uh, when it's so important for our businesses. I know in my community in Barrie-Innismal, it's important, and of course across Ontario. Uh, we know that, of course, the trucking industry is also very important to get goods to market. You know, many businesses in my community, whether they be associated with the Barrie Chamber of Commerce, Commerce or Innisfil Economic Development Department, they need to get products to market. And so I was wondering if the minister could tell us how the Supporting Recovery and Competitiveness Act continues to support our trucking industry. Associate Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the member for that question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have taken multiple measures to ensure that we are supporting uh, the trucking industry. Um, we are uh, focused on making uh, driving more efficient for Ontario's uh, hardest working uh, individuals, our truck drivers. Uh, each year, uh, trucks have to complete multiple inspections in order to operate on our roadways. Uh, additionally, uh, they are subject to emissions testing uh, to ensure they are meeting Ontario's high environmental standards and licensing requirements to ensure. We're easing the burdens on these professionals by consolidating many of these approaches to ensure that they can stay on the road and spend less time complying with uh, many of these and consolidating that process to save them time. We want them to focus on delivering goods like they have been from uh, pharmacies uh, to drug stores uh, to grocery stores. Uh, Response. Day and night. Uh, we are ensuring that they have uh, the ability to continue doing that. We're also renewing license plates uh, for uh, uh, modernizing the license plate renewal system for heavy uh, commercial operating vehicles so they can. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for St. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. When the Premier put forward a reopening plan for the province, this roadmap still means businesses will be closed for weeks, some for months. In fact, this is the first thing St. Catharines gym owner Colin Wolf looked at when counting the days backwards until he can reopen. He will not be able to fully reopen for months. Mr. Premier, if this is the plan we are going to be following, then businesses immediately need a third round of funding. The existing eligibility issues must be immediately addressed and fixed on the current grant. Premier, 
Will you provide details to what kind of third round of funding for small businesses will be created so that local Niagara businesses can finally put this pandemic behind them and get back on their feet? The Associate Minister for Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We recognize how uh, difficult this time is for many small businesses, and it's also why we have put forward unprecedented supports. Over $2.8 billion of direct supports have been paid uh, to small businesses across Ontario, 110,000 in the form of first payments and 86,000 businesses um, in the form of second payments. Uh, along with those supports, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have also uh, reinvested in the largest uh, investment to help businesses go digital, a $57 million program last year, the Digital Main Street program now, gets an additional $10 million to ensure that they can continue helping businesses pivot. We have also put forward supports like 100% of your property tax that is covered, 100% of your energy costs that are covered uh, as well. We recognize that these are significantly challenging times for these business owners, but we Response. are putting forward supports, uh, over $2.8 billion just in the Small Business Support Grant uh, to ensure that they have uh, the resources they need to get through this very difficult time. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me just say this. This is not reassuring to small businesses in St. Catharines or in Niagara that are faced with another prolonged lockdown because of this government. Last month, the Niagara region did their third round of COVID-19 impact on the Niagara businesses, and their findings shine a light on the absolute devastation and cost of repeat lockdowns made by this government's failures. They, they, the survey indicated 81% of businesses experienced loss of income in 2020. The majority of the respondents indicated that it will take over three years before they see a full recovery. Mr. Speaker, the businesses in Niagara and in St. Catharines want to know why does this government refuse to announce a round of third funding for businesses well, it ignores Question. evictions, insurance gouging, and report after report about impacts on the repeated lockdowns. It's not pivoting, it's, it's survival of the fittest in small businesses. And the Associate Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this government has paid out uh, $2.8 billion in direct supports uh, to small businesses that have been impacted uh, by this pandemic just through the Ontario Small Business Support Grant. We have also uh, included now and introduced the uh, Ontario Small Business, uh, uh, sorry, the travel uh, grant of another $100 million uh, to support those businesses that are in the travel industry that are going to be that have been impacted. Um, those again are up to $20,000 grants that this government has put forward, $100 million to ensure that those businesses uh, also get the support that they need. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to do whatever we can. Uh, to support small businesses, just like we did before the pandemic, when we brought in uh, an over 9% reduction in the small business uh, tax rate across the province, uh, um, over $330 million in savings through red tape reduction Question. that we have put forward, uh, making sure that we modernize and keep uh, Ontario competitive and continue working for uh, our small business owners across this province to, through significant supports that we'll continue to put forward to keep them. Thank you very much. The next question, member for Ottawa South. My question is for the Deputy Premier, but I first have to say that it's very disappointing and discouraging to hear the response to the member from Don Valley West that the government can't reinstate the curriculum that they undid. Last week, many seniors and their families felt a sigh of relief when the Premier announced that people 80-plus could rebook their second vaccine appointments earlier. This morning, that sense of relief turned into anger and frustration once again for too many seniors in my community. Our phones are ringing off the hook. As of 9 a.m. this morning, there were no more appointments available in Ottawa. So, Speaker, through you, how are we once again in a situation where we're asking seniors 80 plus, many of whom experienced difficulty booking their first appointment, to go through the same process the second time, with also giving the caveat last week as there's no guarantee you'll get an earlier appointment? Question. Government House Leader. Uh, 
and, and, I, and I apologize that uh, that he's not going to get an answer to his second question until the uh, the supplementary bill. Let me be very clear, Mr. Speaker. At no time did I say that this government and that the members on this side of the house wouldn't do everything that we can to ensure that there is reconciliation in the province of Ontario. What I have said, Mr. Speaker, is that we will not wait years to get it done. We will continue to work hard, whether it's with the Ed Minister of Education, whether it's with the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, whether it's with the Minister of Finance, the members opposite, to ensure Order. that we have a true reconciliation. Today, Mr. Speaker, is about what we saw on the weekend, the horrific events of the weekend. I want to focus on that today and not politics, Mr. Speaker. For one day, I would hope that the members of the Liberal Party could put their focus on what is important. And what's important today Spons. is respecting what we saw on the weekend and making sure that the words for the member of Kewatin, the member of uh, Toronto Centre, that we get it done and we get it done. Right. Today is we need to teach our children. So, Deputy Premier, as of 8.15 this morning, a resident told me she was told there are no more appointments available in Ottawa. And what I can't understand is how we couldn't procure a system or get ourselves organized to not make people go through the same darn process again. It's like we didn't learn anything the first time. If the government was serious about prioritizing seniors, they would have a system that would automatically rebook appointments or figure out a way to do that or organize it so more people were on the phone frustrated than happy. And making seniors and their families go through this again is just, it's just, it's just plain cruel. And I know that phones are ringing off in Nepean, Canada, Ottawa West Nepean, same thing in your offices. So, Speaker, through you, why does this government continue to overpromise and underdeliver, deliver, telling Ontario seniors they can rebook their vaccine appointments sooner, and then literally saying last week there aren't enough appointments to go around? To reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I would say to the member opposite, our, our system and our government is prioritizing seniors as of today, that 80-year-olds, if they wish, they can change the appointment that they already have, the second appointment, for an earlier appointment. There are vaccines available. There are appointments available, perhaps not in the same pharmacy where they received their first, if they received an AstraZeneca vaccine. However, they, it is available on our website at ontario.ca slash coronavirus. They can check which pharmacies are available, which ones do have the AstraZeneca vaccine, and they can rebook. There are appointments available. There is vaccine available, and the seniors are not required to change it. It is only if they wish to have an accelerated dosage. Most of them already have their second appointment already booked. This is something they can do if they wish. If they choose not to, if it's too much trouble for them to do, they can stick with the appointment that they already have. Response? It's very clear and it's very simple to do. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My, min uh, my question is to the Minister of Housing. Last week, I attended a virtual hearing at the Landlord and Tenant Board for two constituents in Parkdale High Park. Teresa de Mesa, a senior, and her disabled son, Anthony, have reliably paid their rent for 30 years, but their landlord, Naspor, is trying to evict them on issues of cleanliness. Despite the stay-at-home order, the Landlord and Tenant Board is processing hundreds of evictions each week, putting the very lives of people like Teresa and Anthony at risk. Why is the minister allowing this? Will the minister put an end to eviction applications and hearings for the duration of the pandemic? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the member for the question. Our government has been crystal clear uh, that when there's a stay-at-home order, uh, there would be a, a pause on uh, the issuance of evictions at the Landlord-Tenant Board. This is something that Ontario's Attorney General uh, did uh, right at the start of the pandemic. Every time, every single time, uh, the government has decided to have a stay-at-home order, we have invoked a residential evictions ban. And uh, through you, Speaker, I can again, as I've said many times in this House, the Attorney General has been working very diligently to deal with uh, uh, the staffing issues uh, at the Landlord-Tenant Board. And as, again, Speaker, I want to remind the House, we put a, uh, a bill uh, forward in this House 
the Protecting Tenants and Strengthening Com uh, Community Housing Act was something that needed to be done. This, uh, that party across the official Response. opposition voted against it. Supplementary question. Speaker, virtual hearings are a nightmare. There are so many technical issues. Tenants get disconnected while giving testimonies, and some are unable to reconnect back into the hearing. The entire experience is confusing. Multiple hearings are scheduled at the same time, and there are frequent interruptions. Now we've heard that this Conservative government is planning on making virtual hearings permanent, even though it is clear that tenants are not getting a fair process. Speaker, I'd like to know if the minister has witnessed any virtual hearings at the Landlord and Tenant Board, because I have, and I can tell you, they don't work. Will the minister commit today to ensure that virtual hearings will not be permanent? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the priority of our government is the health and safety of everybody in Ontario, whether they're interacting through one of our tribunals or independent tribunals. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that as the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has indicated, we, when there's a stay-at-home order, there is a pause on the, on the uh, enforcement of evictions. But that means that we still have to have the system working for both tenants and landlords, Mr. Speaker. We have a record number of, of tribunal appointees hearing these matters so the people who have issues whether they be tenants or landlords can have their matters heard independently and safely thank you mr speaker question the member for guelph thank you speaker i'd like to thank the member for quetnong for his powerful words today my question today is for the premier last friday i attended a zoom rally with thousands of nurses and healthcare professionals calling on the Premier to repeal Bill 124. Nurses are tired of the Premier calling them heroes and champions and then capping and cutting their wages. So, Speaker, tonight I will be cheering for the 500 frontline health care workers at the game while I cheer for the Leafs. But I know all health care workers across this province will cheer if the Premier repeals Bill 124 and gives them the pay increase they've earned and they deserve? It's a yes or no question. Will the Premier do it today? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I think the Honourable Member uh, can appreciate how important uh, uh, nurses have been uh, to, uh, to helping guide us through uh, th this pandemic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we make uh, no bones about that. That is why, of course, we are investing in uh, an initial 2,000 nurses, uh, Mr. Speaker, but it goes even further than that, uh, uh, some 20,000 uh, new additional PS uh, PSWs. So there is a lot of work that is being done to increase uh, uh, the, the, sub the amount of nurses in the system because we know how important they are. It is true, Mr. Speaker. We did inherit a system that was woefully underfunded, that had ICU capacity at one of the lowest in, uh, in, uh, in North America. We're changing that. Finally, Mr. Speaker, we're increasing nurses. We're increasing ICU capacity. We're funding PSWs like never before. We're building long-term care, Mr. Speaker. But we are still allowing, of course, those people, those heroes who work within the system, to see the benefits of their hard work, Mr. Speaker. That has not been taken away through Bill 124, Mr. Speaker. And I hope the member opposite will appreciate that and work with us Response. as we bring in thousands of additional nurses, thousands of additional PSWs to make our system better for everybody. A supplementary question. So, Speaker, I guess that answer is no to the nurses who are tired, to the thousands of nurses thinking about leaving the profession, the nurses who care for our loved ones, but it's also the PSW, Speaker. PSWs are saying they're thinking of leaving the profession because their pandemic pay expires in a month. I've been told if we are going to attract human resource capacity to our health care system, both nurses and PSWs, we need to pay them like the heroes they are. So I'm going to give the members opposite an opportunity to answer this one. Will, Speaker, through you, will the government commit to making the pandemic pay for PSWs permanent? Yes or no? Government House Leader. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, what we are going to commit to do is to ensure that we have the best system available for those who choose to work as PSWs in the province of Ontario. One of the first meetings I had when I was elected was from a PSW who, yes, talked about wages, uh, how important it, uh, it was to have increased wages so that, uh, whether it was PSWs, home care workers, that's why we had a staffing study, Mr. Speaker. We know that one of the problems that we have not only is wages, but it is also the amount of PSWs in the system. That's why we're hiring 27,000 additional PSWs, Speaker. Uh, and it, we go further than that. You know, not, the question was on PSWs, but 2,000 additional nurses. We have a bill that will come before this House today to recognize and organize PSWs, something that they have been asking for for years, Mr. Speaker. We are making tremendous progress because we know how important they are Response. to help and get us through this pandemic, but not just the pandemic. Going forward, whether it's health care, long-term care, Mr. Speaker, we will have their back, and we are the first government in generations to make sure that they do. The next question, the member for York Southwest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. In York Southwest, we are designated hotspots and home to essential frontline workers. Those folks the Premier calls heroes and champions. However, we have been left behind and neglected in this government's mishandled COVID strategy. We have no permanent vaccine facility, and my office is flooded with telephone calls, confused people who got first shot of AstraZeneca at a pharmacy, and now being told they cannot get their second dose there, and are left wondering what they do now. With the vaccine expiring shortly, what is the government doing to ensure uh, these folks in our community get their second dose? And why has the government not been able to get anything right in what is now over 15 months of this pandemic? Minister Health. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member very much for the question. Uh, as the member will know, the uh, doses which are now receiving in, in good supply, particularly the Pfizer doses, but we still have many AstraZeneca doses left as well, are being allocated uh, equitably across all 34 of the public health unit regions. It's up to each individual unit region now to allocate to any hot spots that they wish to designate. That's available to the City of Toronto to do. However, with respect to the AstraZeneca shots, we now know that uh, there were some that were held back because we had to check them for quality assurance because we want to make sure that anything we give to Ontarians is first going to be safe and secondly is going to be effective. So we have received over 30,000 of those shots that have been returned from quality assurance that are ready to be extended and can be given to people and they are available through Response. pharmacies or primary care providers. People can find out where they can receive the shot. It may not be from the original pharmacy that they received it, but they can go online onto the website, ontario.ca slash coronavirus, and they can find out the pharmacies that are carrying those AstraZeneca doses. They can call and book an appointment to receive their second shot. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. We now have a deferred vote on government notice of motion number 111 relating to the extension of the period of emergency. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies.